When the United States Senate opened its 2007 session, Senator Daniel Okaka, Democrat from Hawaii, reintroduced a bill entitled the Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act. The bill's purpose is to form a Native Hawaiian governing entity capable of negotiating with the state of Hawaii and the federal government on behalf of the native people of the Hawaiian Islands. This bill, commonly referred to as the Akaka Bill, is a direct result of a 1993 public apology by the United Church of Christ, whereby the church apologized to Native Hawaiians for its role in the 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The public apology by the church would lead to a formal apology from the 103rd Congress of the United States, known as the Apology Resolution. Public Law 103-150 concludes with a disclaimer that states, nothing in this joint resolution is intended to serve as a settlement of any claims against the United States. Since 1898, the language used in federal documents relating to Hawaii has been anything but clear. Could a century of ambiguous documentation, coupled with a history that possesses multiple versions, serve as the modern-day version of divide and conquer? In attempting to answer this question, it is necessary to first establish an undeniable truth, something everyone can agree upon. For the purposes of this documentary, the filmmakers have decided on this truth. On January 17, 1893, the Kingdom of Hawaii was a duly recognized independent nation. With that as our premise, let us begin our journey. With every quest, there abides a story, a series of detailed facts arranged to assist the seeker in discovering the answer. He Hawaii Ao, e no ko To understand the modern Hawaiian, we must distinguish the Hawaiian of old. The first Polynesians to settle the islands are believed to have come from the Marquesas, circa 300 CE, and were known as Kanaka. Later migrations continued from the society group of islands up until the 14th century. Traditional Kanaka society was advanced and complex, possessing a centralized monarchy, an organized priesthood, and an ordered social system based on rank. As the centuries passed, the structure and functions which defined island culture would evolve through normal means. And for the next 1400 years, Kanaka society would exist under an evolved system of laws and practices known as the Kapu system. In 1791, a powerful and charismatic warrior chief known as Kamehameha Paiea rose from the ranks of the battle chiefs to distinguish himself as a leader of men. Resulting from years of civil war and political finesse, Kamehameha had at last unified the island of Hawaii under his rule. Like the kings and chiefs before him, Kamehameha would orchestrate a political union with Keopuolani, a high-ranking Ni Aupio chiefess from Maui. This strategic union would provide the legitimate rank of his children and heirs. By 1795, Kamehameha would advance his realm by conquering the kingdom of Maui, which included Lanai, Molokai, and Oahu. By 1810, following the peaceful session of Kauai, Kamehameha was now king of the entire archipelago, placing the whole of the eight major islands and beyond under the protectorate of the British Crown. For the next 16 years, the Sandwich Islands would remain as a dubious British protectorate, but a British protectorate nonetheless. Kamehameha formed a two-tier government. The higher level dealt with matters of national interest and foreign policy while the lower level concerned itself with matters of tenancy under a feudal system. As a feudal monarchy, the lands of the kingdom, with the exception of Kauai, were divided between Kamehameha and his four principal chiefs, Ke'eaomoku, Ke'aveaheulu, 
Kameamoku and Kamanawa. The four chiefs were each given large tracts of land from Hawaii to Oahu in return for their loyalty and services in battle. Although each principal chief was practically independent to manage his lands, the ancient laws of the kingdom were so arranged as to have all the force of a written code. Native religion organized and stratified the regional authorities. British principles of governance at the national level organized the roles of the king, the prime minister, and the governors. Ironically, it was through armed conflict that Kamehameha was able to put an end to wars. He was born for the age for which he lived, the age of war and of conquest. Nobly did he fulfill the destiny for which he was created, that of reducing the islands from a state of anarchy and constant warfare to one of peace and unity under the rule of one king. He erected a central government, checked the oppression of the lesser chiefs, commissioned the first national flag, improved the laws and made them more uniform, rigidly enforced them, and generally brought about a condition of comparative peace and well-being. Kamehameha I decreed his son, Kalanikua Liholiho, Kamehameha II, heir to the government. The care of the gods was entrusted to his nephew, Kekuo Kalani. After the passing of Kamehameha I on the 8th of May, 1819, the kingdom would experience a radical change in governance. The transition from prince to king was not an easy one for Liholiho. One of the more prominent laws of the ancient religious system was that of the aikapu, which placed specific restrictions on when and what foods could be eaten and by whom. Men and women ate separately, and women were restricted from eating pork, certain fish, and most kinds of banana and coconut. Any infractions were punishable by death. However, following the death of Kamehameha I, Customary law suspended the aikapu, and free eating was tolerated during this period of mourning. This period was known as Ainoa. According to ancient law, Ainoa would conclude with the sanction of the new king or ruling chief. The final decision to restore the aikapu was Liholiho's. Remarkably, though Liholiho was king, he was not the highest ranking chief. That distinction was that of his mother, Keopuolani, who, with the support of many of the high chiefs, revealed to her son her desire to abolish the Aikapu when she said, He who guarded the god is dead, and it is right that we should eat together freely. Liho Liho would eventually concede, commencing the first step in the dismantling of the ancient religion. Anointed by Kamehameha I as the keeper of the kapu, Kekuo Kalani would resist Liholiho's decision to abandon the ancient gods, giving every indication that he and his army would die to protect the ancient customs. No matter how it is viewed, the fact remains that the prolonged interruption of the Ai kapu served as the catalyst which would trigger a chain of events that led to the Battle of Kuomo'o the final battle for the ancient religion, culminating with the destruction of all religious temples and idols. The overthrow of the religious system created a period of political instability. The kingdom now faced a future absent the instrument, which for so long had governed the organization and stratification of Hawaiian society. March of 1820 saw the arrival of American missionaries to the Sandwich Islands. But these were not the religious instructors whom the king and chiefs expected from England. While Liholiho considered inquiries by his chiefs as to the nature of these uninvited foreigners, the American missionaries were prohibited from coming ashore. 
of paramount concern to the new king was what religion these missionaries conformed to. The king's fears were dispelled on the assurances of John Young, who informed the chiefs that the American missionaries preached the same religion as the expected English missionaries. Soon after, the Americans were allowed ashore, and after meetings with the king were granted a license of one-year residency, which the king later extended. For the next four years, the American missionaries working alongside the chiefs would reduce the Hawaiian language to a written form. They would provide instruction on reading and writing, and through this medium were able to teach the Christian religion to the chiefly class at first, then to the masses. The business of resolving questions regarding the Sandwich Islands as a British protectorate persuaded Liholiho to travel to Britain to meet with King George IV. On the 27th of November, 1823, Liholiho departs for London on a mission of diplomacy. The purpose of the King's trip was to confirm the cession of his father's kingdom to Great Britain. It's often kind of treated as kind of a whimsical journey. You know, here's this Hawaiian jumping on a ship, sailing off. And, uh, but when you really think about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, it's brilliant. It's, it's courageous, uh, you know. Very few leaders of countries at that time in the world would ever think about leaving, first of all, leaving behind their nation because when they leave, somebody else would take it. But that's the kind of confidence he had in his people, in himself. In Liholiho's absence, the kingdom was left under the administration of Ka'ahumanu, favorite wife of Kamehameha the Great. Under Ka'ahumanu, the kingdom would undergo an accelerated change in domestic policy. On December 21, 1823, less than a month following the king's departure, Ka'ahumanu proclaimed Christianity as the kingdom's religion. On April 13, 1824, Ka'ahumanu met with the chiefs in council in Honolulu to make known their decision to extend the teaching of reading, writing, and Christianity to the common people. In June of 1824, she proclaimed by crier law prohibiting murder, theft, fighting among the people, and added, When schools are established, all the people shall learn reading and writing. These changes not only paved the way for universal literacy throughout the kingdom, but also regarding Christianity, served to fill a void left by the abrogation of the ancient religion. By all accounts, Ka'ahumanu's installment of Christianity was not without the king's sanction. And as a consequence, the kingdom of the Sandwich Islands achieved literacy through religion and vice versa. These changes would resist what little opposition it encountered and would establish a path for the kingdom to follow for the next century. Liholiho prepared for his audience with King George IV. In June of 1824, Liholiho dispatched a letter to Hawaii. The letter was addressed to Kalanimoku, Ka'ahumanu, and his younger brother, Kawikeuli. Liholiho describes the delegation's arrival in London, where they were received by representatives of the king and writes, The king of England has taken a great liking to us. After stating that he had yet to meet King George, he disclosed his illness and that of his wife, Queen Kamamalu, as well as the chief, Kapihe. The letter goes on to conclude that, We will remain until we see the king. For when we obtain that which will be of great benefit to us, then will we return. It would be the last dispatch Liholiho would ever send. They had contracted measles while in London and were unable to recover. Kamal Malu was the first to die on the 8th of July, and despite attendance by King George's personal physicians, on the 14th of July, 1824, Liholiho's death was confirmed. Kamehameha II had died in London. Though Liholiho was unable to meet King George IV, the remaining Sandwich Island delegation, headed by the High Chief Boki, did obtain an audience with the British King. Boki explained that it was the desire of Kamehameha II 
to confirm the words of his father regarding the cession of the Sandwich Islands to Great Britain. The delegation received confirmation of the political standing of the Sandwich Islands as a British protectorate, but suffered a less than desirable explanation outlining the exact roles of the two parties. Though the Sandwich Islands were in fact a British protectorate, uncertainties would eventually develop into a source of agitation between the two governments. To define this situation and afford it a more suitable frame of reference, we must appreciate that in 1824, British law regarding the duties and obligations of protectorates was still being developed. On the 4th of May, 1825, the HMS Blonde, under the command of Lord Byron, arrived in Lahaina carrying the bodies of the deceased king and queen. With the ascension of Kamehameha II to the throne, the couple were broken. The wild orgies of heathenism were abolished, the idols thrown down, and in their place was set up the worship of the only living and true God. His was the era of the introduction of Christianity and all its peaceful influences. He was born to commence the great moral revolution which began with his reign, and he performed his cycle. On the 4th of May, 1825, the HMS Blonde, under the command of Lord Byron, arrived in Lahaina carrying the bodies of the deceased king and queen. Following the royal funeral and a period of mourning for the fallen king, a meeting of the Council of Chiefs was convened on the 6th of June to confirm Kauikeoli's succession to the throne of the Sandwich Islands. Being 11 years old at the time, it was agreed that Ka'ahumanu would continue as regent and Kalanimoku as premier, as Kauikeoli would now have to learn firsthand the rigors of ruling. The future of the tiny kingdom would be suggested in a line from a speech given by Kaui Keoli shortly after succeeding the throne, when he proclaimed, Heo puni palapala ko, mine shall be a kingdom of literacy. At age 13, he promulgated, together with the Council of Chiefs, the nation's first penal code. Like his brother before him, Kaui Keoli inherited a perplexing situation regarding the political relationship between the Sandwich Islands and Britain. In 1829, a visiting American naval officer, Captain W.B. Finch, chronicles the earliest recorded use of the word Hawaiian to refer to the kingdom. The government and natives generally have dropped or do not admit the designation of Sandwich Islands as applied to their possessions but adopt and use that of Hawaiian, in allusion to the fact of the whole group having been subjugated by the first Tamehameha, who was the chief of the principal island of Owehi, or more modernly, Hawaii. While Kaui Keoli balanced amusement with ruling, the young nation was still feeling its way into the modern era. Matters of state were made increasingly cumbersome by a steady influx of visitors. Foreign ships arriving in the islands carried people from all walks of life. Some as curious tourists en route to another port of call, and others who arrived with the intention of staying. In 1827, a group of Catholic missionaries from France arrived in Honolulu. Unlike their Protestant counterparts, the Catholic missionaries made no attempt to obtain a license or permission to reside in the islands. By 1829, they were able to establish a small following amongst the native population. The Hawaiian government viewed the Catholic enterprise as divisive and took action to avoid disunity among the natives. In January of 1830, by order of Ka'ahumanu, the teaching of the Catholic religion was forbidden throughout the kingdom, and Catholic missionaries were expelled from the country soon after. 
It is important to understand this era in the kingdom. Hawaiian society was a mere decade removed from the ancient kapu system, a system which for so long had provided Hawaiian society with its organic laws, its customs, and its traditions. When the ancient religion was replaced by the Christian teachings, Protestant had effectively become the national religion. And as religion and government were so intertwined, an assault on the national religion was essentially viewed as an assault on the government and its authority. In keeping with his policy regarding education, the king sanctioned the establishment of the country's first institution of higher learning at Lahaina Luna. Under the administration of William Richards, an American missionary and religious advisor to the king, Lahaina Luna Seminary would inspire a collective movement towards literacy, prompting the school to establish the nation's first newspaper, Kalama Hawaii. Hawaiian language newspapers start in 1834 and they go to 1948. Now, a couple of years after the Hawaiian language newspapers start, English language newspapers start as well. There's an initial set of newspapers. There's a growing English language population as well. They run parallel the whole time and often interact. People will read something in the English paper, write about it in the Hawaiian paper, or vice versa. Founded on Protestant ideals, Lauren Andrews was chosen to become the first principal of Lahaina Luna and served as editor of the newspaper. Kalama was heralded as an instant sensation. The natives read or listened with wonder as a world previously unknown to them unfolded with every turn of the page. Kalama's success would ignite an explosion of aspiring Hawaiian newspapers. Over 100 Hawaiian language newspaper publications would develop, providing news and entertainment to a population who had obtained a rate of literacy higher than most educated modern countries. The rise of literacy uh, articulates with the sweeping changes that are going on. And in a society where all of history and all of collective knowledge is really held in the minds of individuals, they're going through a time when a knowledgeable person dying is like a library burning down. So being able to use the written word and being able to publish that and make it not only permanent on the, on the written form, but make it distributed among the whole nation, made that material um, permanent in a way that memory never did. In 1832, following the death of Ka'ahumanu, Kaui Keoli, at the age of 18, assumed full control of the Hawaiian Kingdom and appointed Kina'u to succeed Ka'ahumanu as premier. The subsequent arrival of more Catholic priests in Honolulu impelled the government to affirm its anti-Catholic policy with absolute authority. And in 1837, Kaui Keoli issued a royal proclamation banning the Catholic religion from the kingdom. Though the intention of Kaui Keoli was to maintain peace, the proclamation would incense European powers still loyal to the Pope. And in 1839, in direct response to this policy, a French warship under the command of Captain Laplace arrived in Honolulu. The king was informed of Captain Laplace's arrival and of the five demands made by the French captain. Paramount was France's insistence that the Catholic religion be allowed back into the Hawaiian Kingdom. Under threat of war, the Hawaiian government conceded to the demands made by Laplace, and Catholic missionaries were allowed back into Hawaii. The Laplace incident had been a costly and somewhat humiliating lesson for the king and his developing young country. Kamehameha III resolved that he must adapt his country to protect it. Undeterred by French aggression, Kamehameha III determined to pursue government reform that sought to establish and to protect the rights of his people.
Kamehameha III realized that his government stood upon the crumbling foundations of an archaic system. Foreigners were the source for many of the difficulties facing the government. Concerns regarding immigration, trade, residency, and religion obligated the king to restructure his government. If there was to be any hope of preserving his kingdom, then some fundamental laws were required. Despite the Laplace incident, Kamehameha III, Kawikeoli, would continue government reform. This would ultimately lead Kamehameha to relinquish his absolute authority under a written constitution. A written constitution that he would voluntarily give. History of constitutions among monarchs throughout the world were never voluntarily given. It was always by force. The barons, the English barons of England, they forced it upon King John. For Hawaii, it was Kamehameha III who would do it for the best interests of his country, his nation, and provide the foundation for the rule of law in Hawaii. On June 7, 1839, Kamehameha III proclaimed a declaration of rights for his subjects. The following year, on October 8, he granted the first constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom, which incorporated the Declaration of Rights as its preamble. By that constitution, the king voluntarily relinquished some of his powers and attributes as an absolute ruler. The constitution immediately provided two critical qualities, essential to feeble nations during that era. On the one hand, it provided Kamehameha III a firm foundation upon which to further codify traditional observances moving governance from the realm of custom into the realm of law. While on the other hand, and perhaps more importantly, the Constitution of 1840 assumed a geopolitical purpose serving as a caveat to other nations. No longer would Hawaii be viewed as a primitive society. In one fell swoop, the Hawaiian Kingdom was transformed from one of antiquity into a country embracing modernization. What the Laplace incident did do was that it motivated Kamehameha III to pursue the international recognition of Hawaii as an independent and sovereign state. Laplace embarrassed Kamehameha III. Kamehameha III thought he was an independent sovereign. That was not the case. In order to settle this once and for all, he dispatched three representatives, three envoys, to secure international recognition of his country as an independent and sovereign state. To achieve this at that time, he needed formal and explicit recognition from the United States of America, Great Britain, and France. With the Constitution in place, Kaui Keoli now turned his attention towards the recognition of Hawaiian independence. On October 4, 1842, a communication from Viscount Canning on behalf of the British Secretary of Foreign Affairs was dispatched to the British Admiralty. Lord Aberdeen does not think it advantageous or politic to seek to establish a paramount influence for Great Britain in those islands at the expense of those enjoyed by other powers. All that appears to his lordship to be required is that no other power should exercise a greater degree of influence than that possessed by Great Britain. The information of Britain's passive position regarding Hawaii was welcomed news. For Hawaiian agents commissioned by the king were already en route to Europe and America. Between July and August of 1842, Kamehameha III set in motion a plan to secure the recognized independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. To accomplish this, the king dispatched three envoys to represent his request for formal recognition. Timoteo Ha'alilio, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson. While Hawaiian diplomats advanced their missions in Europe and the United States, Honolulu was under siege. In February of 1843, Her British Majesty's ship, Carisfort, under the command of Lord Paulette, was directed to Honolulu from Valparaiso to investigate the claims made by British Consulate Charlton of unfair treatment of British subjects and proceeded making outrageous demands on the Hawaiian government. Paulette threatened to open fire on Honolulu if the government was not handed over to him in the name of the British Crown. 
Kamehameha III surrendered the kingdom to avoid hostilities, but did so under written protest and pending the outcome of the mission of his diplomats in Europe. In the Hawaiian language newspaper, Kanona Nona, Kamehameha III explained to his people the events which had transpired and declared. E I have given away our sovereignty, and the nation held its breath. He presents his letter explaining that he has been imposed upon for no reason. He has had to give up the, the air of the land, and that his rule over his people and the foreigners who are residing will continue on, and he's hopeful that the sovereignty will be returned. While news of Paulette's actions reached the British Admiralty in Valparaiso, Chile, the two Hawaiian envoys received a letter in Paris from G.P. Judd apprising them of the situation back at home, prompting them to draft a letter which was printed in a French newspaper of Lord Paulette's aggressive actions against the Hawaiian Kingdom. In July of 1843, Right Lord Admiral Richard Thomas arrived in Honolulu in direct response. Admiral Thomas requested an audience with the king, and after meeting with Kamehameha III, determined that the complaints by British officers did not warrant a takeover. He ordered the immediate restoration of the Hawaiian government, which took place at a grand ceremony at what is known today as Thomas Square. Following the official ceremony, a service of thanksgiving was held at Kauaiaha'o Church, and Kamehameha III proclaimed before a large crowd, The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Pali Leo and Richards, again going out to the outside world, um, dealing with you know, racism at the time in America. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful story that a friend of mine, Lawrence Gonshaw, translated from a French newspaper. Um, you may have seen it. It talks about, you know, they're at this dinner, they're at this banquet uh, in D.C. And, um, you know, it's time to eat. And Richards and Hali Leo are going to go in and eat together with the diplomats. And, of course, you know, the racism being what it was at the time in the U.S., you know, they approach Richards and say, I'm sorry, your servant needs to beat it and eat with the servants, right? And what's amazing is that uh, Richards, you know, Ho'opolo lays them, he corrects them and says, actually, this is, this is a diplomat, he's a representative of the Hawaiian kingdom. And they say, well, too bad. And uh, what's really amazing about it is Richards then goes and eats with Ha'olileo, with the so-called servants. And uh, it really gives you a, a, a picture of what was happening at that time in the kingdom harmonious, to a large extent, harmonious country where, you know, you had people of different ethnicities that believed in Hawaiian independence and sacrificed their lives for it, you know. By the end of 1843, Hawaiian envoys would succeed in their mission of securing international recognition of the Hawaiian Islands as a sovereign and independent state. Great Britain and France formally recognized Hawaiian sovereignty on November 28, 1843, by joint proclamation at the Court of London. The United States followed on July 6, 1844, by letter from Secretary of State John C. Calhoun. The Hawaiian Islands became the first Polynesian and non-European nation to be recognized as an independent and sovereign nation. By 1844, Kamehameha III refocused his attention towards domestic affairs and the organization and maintenance of the newly recognized Hawaiian Kingdom. In 1845, he addressed the land tenure system by initiating the first phase of a massive land division, an event that would come to be known as the Great Mahele. The Mahele evolved formally or on paper or in law, uh, starting with the 1839 Declaration of Rights, codified into the 1840 Constitution, where it says to the effect, Kamehameha did not own all the land by himself. He owned it with the chiefs and people in common. 
And that's a very broad, yeah, that's constitutional law, broad statements. Uh, 1846 Principles of the Land Commission, which becomes statutory law, further refines what was that broader vision. And in the Principles of the Land Commission, it states there are about three classes of persons having vested interests. First, the government. Second, the konihiki. Third, the native tenants. It next becomes necessary to ascertain the proportional rights of each. When you understand the mahele as an imposition, as this step-by-step -step process of colonial imposition, American imposition, you miss out on that. And you don't even take a look at the fact that what is there is Hawaiian being transitioned into this new form. In 1849, there was an adverse situation that developed in the kingdom where the French uh, kind of shot up some of the harbor, took over a barracks, and um, eventually the, the situation was settled. And uh, what they decided was to send out Judd to go to France, to go to the United States, go to Britain, negotiate new series of treaties and try to get reparations with France. And um, in the discussion in Privy Council, uh, they also decide, well, if Judd is going to go out here, let's send the princes along, that being Alexander, Liholiho, Lot Kapuaiva, the future leaders, monarchs of the kingdom. I believe when they left, Lot was 17, Alexander was 15. Eventually they go through Mexico. In Britain, they're, they're treated with the utmost respect, you know. They visit Windsor Castle, they, they tour Buckingham Palace. Um, Alexander actually has a face-to-face -face meeting with Prince Albert, you know. Two future leaders of countries looking face-to-face, -face, contemplating the future of, of their nation. The king's next priority was the task of appointing capable ministers to assist in the development of a constitutional form of government. The strain on the king was understandable when it became exceedingly clear that the most capable men were foreigners. The chiefs voiced their concerns regarding the placement of foreigners in such high offices of government. After careful deliberation, Kamehameha III asked his chiefs to trust his decisions. Before any foreigner could assume a role in government, they were required to swear allegiance to the kingdom, after which they were granted patents of citizenship. On October 29, 1845, Kamehameha III appointed Robert Wiley as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jared P. Judd as Minister of Finance, William Richards as Minister of Education, and John Record as Attorney General. Of the four newly appointed High Ministers, it was John Record who would provide the government with the reform it so desperately desired. Record sorted the Constitution into departments, prescribing machinery to render them effective. In his report to the legislature, he concluded that the legislature studied the governments of other countries. France and Belgium's government were based on a Roman or civil law tradition, while the tradition in Britain and the United States were based on a common law. Kamakau best summarizes this period when he recounted Record's suggestion to the 1845 legislature. The laws of Rome, the government from which all other governments of Europe, Western Asia, and Africa descended, could not be used for Hawaii, nor could those of England, France, or any other country. The Hawaiian people must have laws adapted to their mode of living, but it is right to study the laws of other people, and fitting that those who conduct law offices in Hawaii should understand these other laws and compare them to see which are adapted to our way of living and which are not. In the end, the organic laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom were based on a hybrid of both civil and common law principles. In 1851, the legislature passed a resolution calling for the appointment of three commissioners to propose amendments to the Constitution. The draft of the revised Constitution was approved by the legislature and, on June 14, Kamehameha III signed into law the Constitution of 1852. Though the Constitution of 1852 was a vast improvement on its predecessor, there still remain remnants of absolutism in Articles 39 and 45. 
These provisions were retained mainly due to a decade of French naval aggression, which in 1849 forced Kamehameha III to consider placing the kingdom under the protection of the United States. This tactic would silence French contempt once and for all. The Hawaiian government entertained the idea of a permanent agreement with the United States, but terms and conditions could not be agreed upon, and all talks ended with the untimely death of Kamehameha III in December of 1854. Alexander Liholiho succeeded to the throne and was styled Kamehameha IV. In his first speech to the legislature as king, Alexander Liholiho remembers his fallen chief. By the death of Kamehameha III, the chain that carried us back to the ancient days of Kamehameha the Great has been broken. He was the last child of that great chieftain. The good, the generous, the kind-hearted Kamehameha is now no more. Our great chief is fallen, but though dead, he still lives. He lives in the hearts of his people. He lives in the liberal, the just, and the beneficial measures which it was always his pleasure to adopt. His monuments rise to greet us on every side. They may be seen in the church, in the schoolhouse, and the hall of justice, in the peace, the law, the order, and general prosperity that prevail throughout the islands. He was the friend of the Maka'ainana, the father of his people. And so long as the Hawaiian lives, his memory will be cherished. You can see how these ali'i are, are growing, how they're interpreting the things that they see in the outside world, and how it's changing the way that they're viewing themselves, the way that they're viewing the future course of Hawaiian history. Um, and Alexander is, is very clear on this. You know, he, he likes f French uh, culture actually the best, and, and Britain a little less. Um, but he's very clear that America is kind of somewhat lacking. Um, and and he, he goes on to say, Here I state, I'm disappointed at the Americans. They have no manners, no politeness, not even common civilities to a stranger. And not only in this case, but almost everybody that one meets in traveling the United States are saucy. Their experience in, in the United States, I think, has a fundamental impact on the future relations of the United States and the kingdom at the time. Um, Alexander, when he does become Kamehameha IV, um, is adamant about preserving Hawaiian independence um, and, and is, is willing to stand up to any threats by any foreign powers. Um, and I think keeping in mind the way they understood that different countries functioned in different ways. And, and they understood that some were better than others. Um, some, it didn't necessarily matter the color of your skin as much as the content of your character. And that's something that they saw that was lacking in the United States. Under the leadership of Kamehameha IV, the Hawaiian Kingdom government would experience further refinement. The organization of government offices would be clarified and defined by law. In 1860, the kingdom's first official census was initiated. Regarding those last remnants of absolutism retained in the Constitution, Kamehameha IV sought to rid the ancient privileges by constitutional amendment, but was unsuccessful. In May of 1858, the kingdom rejoiced and celebrated the birth of Hawaii's royal prince born to the royal couple, Prince Albert Edward Kawikeoli Kaleopapa Kamehameha. Kamehameha IV would promote an ambitious public health care program that included the building of public hospitals and homes for the elderly to address the onslaught of influenza and leprosy that was decimating his people. His legacy would live on through the founding of Queen's Hospital, Hawaii's first organized healthcare system. Ironically, of the many successes attributed to Kamehameha IV, he is perhaps most famously remembered for a great tragedy. On August 27, 1862, the only son of Kamehameha IV and Queen Emma died at the age of four years. 
The anguish felt throughout the realm was absolute. The tiny kingdom was in mourning. And none grieved more than the king. Alexander Liholiho would not recover from the loss of his son. And three months later, on November 30th, the king was dead. With the death of Kamehameha IV, Hawaiian law provides for Victor Kamamalu, the premier, to be monarch. It was Victor Kamamalu as the monarch that appointed Lat Kapuaiva successor to the throne. And confirmation from the nobles were received, thus confirming Lat Kamehameha to be Kamehameha V. Upon his ascension to the throne, Kamehameha V refused to take the oath of office until the constitution was altered in order to remove those remaining sovereign prerogatives that ran contrary to the principles of a constitutional monarchy, namely Articles 39 and 45. The king knew that if he took the oath, he would have bound himself to the constitution whereby any change or amendment to that constitution was vested solely with the Legislative Assembly. By refusing to take the oath, he reserved to himself the responsibility of change, which ironically was authorized by the very articles he sought to amend. This formed the basis for Kamehameha V to convene the first Constitutional Convention on July 7, 1864. From July 7 to August 8, the delegates convened to read and discuss every article until the convention arrived at Article 62. The convention was at a stalemate. They couldn't pass that one provision of voter qualification. Kamehameha V tried more than once to resolve this issue, but it failed. He had no alternative but to dissolve the convention. He dissolved the convention abrogated or terminated the Constitution of 1852 and said, I will bring out another Constitution. And this was the basis of Kamehameha V proclaiming the Constitution of 1864, which he was authorized to do by the very article, Article 45, that was removed. In his speech at the opening of the Legislative Assembly of 1864, Kamehameha V explained his action of abrogating the 1852 Constitution and proclaiming a new Constitution by making specific reference to the 45th Article, which reserved to the Sovereign the right to conduct personally, in cooperation with the Kohina Nui or Premier, but without the intervention of a ministry or the approval of the Legislature, such portions of the public business as he might choose to undertake. The last remnants of absolutism were removed from Hawaiian law. In the new constitution, the crown was now and forever bound to take the oath of office upon ascension to the throne. More importantly, the sole authority to amend or alter the constitution was now vested in the legislative assembly. The constitution of 1864 and the method by which it came about has been erroneously described as a coup d'etat that sought to increase the power of the crown. Nothing could be further from the truth. The 1864 Legislative Assembly appointed a special committee which was comprised of John E. E., Godfrey Rhodes, and J. W. H. Kauai to respond to Kamehameha V's speech opening the new legislature. The committee recognized the constitutionality of the king's prerogative under the former constitution and acknowledged that This prerogative, converted into a right by the terms of the 1852 constitution, your majesty has now parted with, both for yourself and successors. And this assembly thoroughly recognized the sound judgment by which your majesty was actuated in the abandonment of a privilege which, at some future time, might have been productive of untold evil to the nation. On December 11, 1872, Kamehameha V died without naming a successor to the throne. The task of electing a new king fell to the Legislative Assembly in accordance with the Constitution. William Charles Lunalilo and David Kalakaua 
were the forerunners for the throne. Desiring to know the wishes of the people, Lunalilo called for an unofficial public election and received all but one vote, which the legislature confirmed a few days later. And on January 8, 1873, the legislature elected William Charles Lunalilo to the throne, becoming the kingdom's first elected monarch. Sadly, King Lunalilo died a year later, and once again, the kingdom was left without an heir to the throne. On February 12, 1874, the Hawaiian legislature elected David Kalakaua as king. During this special session in 1874, the legislature not only confirmed Kalakaua as successor to the throne by election, but also the legislature repealed the voter qualifications of Article 62 in the Constitution, and Kalakaua signed it into law. Two days later, King Kalakaua named his brother William Pitt Leleo Hoku to be his successor. However, on April 10, 1877, Leleo Hoku died. Kalakaua immediately appointed his sister, Princess Liliuo Kalani, as heir apparent and received confirmation from the nobles. In 1881, King David Kalakaua was the first monarch to circumnavigate the world on a mission to strengthen foreign relations and to introduce Hawaii to the world. Before embarking on this trip, he had the cornerstone laid for the building of Iolani Palace and furnished it with items ordered during his travels. Both these endeavors were intended to elevate and promote the dignity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a fledgling member of the family of nations. However, the king's aggressive campaign to promote the Hawaiian Kingdom as a modern country was quite costly and depleted the kingdom's treasury, which contributed to dissension and mistrust amongst the foreign population. During the summer of 1887, while the legislature remained out of session, a minority of Hawaiian subjects and foreign nationals met to organize a takeover of the political rights of natives. A heavily armed volunteer militia, whose members were predominantly U.S. citizens, called themselves the Hawaiian League. The League made certain demands on King Kalakaua and called for the immediate change of the King's cabinet ministers. Under threat of violence, Kalakaua reluctantly agreed to alter his cabinet ministry, which now consisted of all Hawaiian League members. The purpose of the League was to seize control of the government to advance their own financial gains. In order to succeed, a plan to neutralize the native vote was devised. Operating in strict secrecy, the conspirators prepared a new constitution, which they would force on the king at gunpoint if necessary. The new constitution would allow anyone, citizen or non-citizen, not only the right to vote, but also provided for the election of nobles. The draft was completed in just five days. Rumors of planned acts of violence against Hawaiian subjects mingled with whispers of a scheme to assassinate the king reached Iolani Palace. Fearing a bloody revolution, as well as for his own safety, the king was forced to offer his approval on July 6, and thereafter, the 1887 constitution presumably annulled the former constitution and was declared the new law of the land. This so-called constitution came to be known as the Bayonet Constitution. It was written by a select group of 21 men and effectively placed control of the legislature and cabinet in the hands of individuals who held foreign allegiances. Unlike the Kamehamehas, Kalakaua did not possess the constitutional authority to promulgate a new constitution without legislative approval. 
where Hawaiian law once provided a measure of absolute authority to be utilized by the monarch, Kalakaua never enjoyed that privilege. With the king's powers severely reduced, Hawaiian nationals rallied to coordinate their resistance. The reaction of this seditious act against the crown and the people would result in the formation of political organizations. Starting with Hui Kalai Aina in 1888, and in 1889, the secret formation of the Liberal Patriotic Association, whose purpose was to restore the former system of government and the former rights of the king. From 1887 to 1891, there was an active opposition to the minority of revolutionaries by the Hawaiian citizenry, ranging from peaceful organized resistance to an unsuccessful armed attack against the usurpers. Skirmishes in a war of wills broke out frequently throughout the country. They were seen on the floor of the legislature, in the courts, at social events, and most visibly in the many newspapers. The conspirators would struggle to maintain their control of the seat of government in the face of resistance demonstrated by Hawaiian subjects and foreign diplomats. On January 21, 1891, King David Kalakaua died in San Francisco. The king's remains returned to Honolulu on January 29th. That afternoon, in a meeting of the Privy Council, Liliuokalani took the oath of office, where she swore, in the presence of God Almighty, to maintain the constitution of the kingdom whole and inviolate, and to govern in conformity therewith. Liliuokalani inherited a monarchy fraught with political treachery. At the behest of her people, on January 14, 1893, the Queen announced her intention to proclaim the reinstatement of the lawful constitution of 1864. News of the Queen's plan compelled Lauren Thurston, a key protagonist in the 1887 Bayonet Constitution incident, to organize the revolutionaries into a group under the name the Committee of Safety. Their objectives were simple. First, secure a takeover of the Hawaiian government. And second, to hand over the kingdom to the United States. However, the Committee of Safety could not have succeeded without the help of the U.S. resident minister, John L. Stevens, who, as part of the plan, would order the landing of the U.S. Marines in Honolulu, providing protection for the usurpers. Stephen's role in the overthrow would tip the balance of power in favor of the Committee of Safety. On the morning of January 17, 1893, the Committee of Safety declared itself to be the provisional government and was headed by Sanford Dole. With American cannons and machine guns trained on Iolani Palace, members of the Committee of Safety proclaimed the provisional government of Hawaii. Utilizing the military strength of the U.S. troops, the provisional government placed the Queen under house arrest. On February 14th, a treaty was signed between the provisional government and Secretary of State James Blaine. President Benjamin Harrison thereafter submitted the treaty to the United States Senate for ratification, in accordance with the U.S. Constitution. However, the election for the U.S. presidency just a few months earlier saw the defeat of Benjamin Harrison by the president-elect Grover Cleveland. Upon entering office, President Cleveland received notice by Hawaiian envoys commissioned by the Queen. 
that the overthrow and so-called revolution of the Hawaiian Kingdom government derived from the illegal intervention by U.S. diplomats and military personnel. Cleveland immediately withdrew the treaty from the Senate. President Cleveland appointed James Blount as special commissioner to investigate the overthrow and to report his findings. James Blount arrived in Honolulu in April of 1893. Upon his arrival, one of Blount's first acts was to relieve U.S. Minister to Hawaii John L. Stevens and order American troops off of Hawaiian soil. He then ordered the removal of the American flag and the raising of the Hawaiian flag. From April to October 1893, Special Commissioner to the President James Blount would conduct hundreds of interviews. The Blount investigation found that the United States legation assigned to the Hawaiian Kingdom, together with the United States Marine and Naval personnel, were directly responsible for the overthrow of the Hawaiian government. The report also detailed the culpability of the United States government in violating international laws concerning Hawaiian state territorial sovereignty. Blount wrote, In pursuance of prearranged plan, the government thus established hastened off commissioners to Washington to make a treaty for the purpose of annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. On October 18th, Secretary of State Walter Gresham concluded the investigation and apprised the president of the circumstances in Hawaii. Secretary Gresham reports to President Cleveland that the government of Hawaii surrendered its authority under a threat of war until such time only as the government of the United States, upon the facts being presented to it, should reinstate the constitutional sovereign. The provisional government was created to exist until terms of union with the United States of America have been negotiated and agreed upon. Careful considerations of the facts, I think, convince that the treaty which was withdrawn from the Senate for further consideration should not be resubmitted for its action thereon. Should not the great wrong done to a feeble but independent state by an abuse of the authority of the United States be undone by restoring the legitimate government? Anything short of that will not, I respectfully submit, satisfy the demands of justice. Can the United States consistently insist that other nations shall respect the independence of Hawaii while not respecting it themselves? Our government was the first to recognize the independence of the islands, and it should be the last to acquire sovereignty over them by force and fraud. In a communication from Gresham to Albert Willis, U.S. Ambassador to Hawaii, October 18th. On your arrival at Honolulu, you will take advantage of an early opportunity to inform the Queen of this determination, making known to her the President's sincere regret that the reprehensible conduct of the American minister and the unauthorized presence on land of a military force of the United States obliged her to surrender her sovereignty for the time being and rely on the justice of this government to undo the flagrant wrong. You will, however, at the same time, inform the Queen that, when reinstated, the President expects that she will pursue a magnanimous course by granting full amnesty to all who participate in the movement against her, including persons who are, or have been, officially or otherwise connected with the provisional government, depriving of no right or privilege they enjoyed before the so-called revolution. All obligations created by the provisional government in due course of administration should be assumed. Having secured the Queen's agreement to pursue this wise and humane policy, which it is believed you will speedily obtain, you will then advise the executive of the provisional government and his ministers of the President's determination. On December 18, 1893, President Cleveland addressed the United States Congress. He described the United States' action in Honolulu on January 17th as An act of war committed with the participation of diplomatic representative of the United States and without the authority of Congress? Through such acts, the government of a peaceful and friendly nation was overthrown. A substantial wrong has thus been done with a due regard for our national character, as well as the rights of injured people, requires we should endeavor to repair. President Cleveland committed to the Queen that he would restore the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom if the Queen would provide amnesty for the revolutionaries. Initially, Lili'uokalani resisted the idea of pardoning the traitors involved in the overthrow. 
But after some dialogue with the president and his representatives, she consented to the terms and conditions of the agreement and waited patiently for the president to take action. However, powerful political forces with dreams of an American empire made it impossible for Cleveland to follow through on his commitment to reinstate the lawful Hawaiian government. Hawaii was a treasure too precious to ignore, and American expansionists looked on her with hungry eyes. Without the assistance of President Cleveland, the Queen and her country was left to suffer under the control of the American puppet regime. In a deliberate move to guarantee the isolation of the Hawaiian Kingdom from any assistance from other countries and to reinforce and protect the installed government, the House and Senate each passed similar resolutions in 1894, warning other countries that any intervention in the political affairs of the Hawaiian Islands by any other government will be regarded as an act unfriendly to the United States. This policy of intimidation would insulate the pretenders while they waited for a new president. A president who would be willing to overlook not only violations of international law, but also willing to circumvent U.S. constitutional law. In 1897, William McKinley was sworn in as the 25th president of the United States. In June of 1897, a second treaty of annexation was signed between the United States and the Republic of Hawaii formerly known as the Provisional Government. It is clear by the evidence provided in the final draft of the Blount Report that the Republic of Hawaii, like its predecessor, the Provisional Government, was by definition a U.S.-installed government. To put a fine point on it, all attempts at a treaty of annexation between the United States and the Republic of Hawaii or its predecessor is in truth an action by one party pretending to be two. This fact did not escape the U.S. Senate when they considered ratifying the second attempt at a treaty to annex the Hawaiian Islands in December of 1897. The Senate's task was not made easier when they received a diplomatic protest filed by the Queen who traveled to Washington, D.C. to contest the attempted treaty. The Queen stated in part, I, Liliu Okleni of Hawaii, do hereby protest against the ratification of a certain treaty, which, so I am informed, has been signed at Washington by Messrs. Hatch, Thurston, and Kinney, purporting to cede those islands to the territory and dominion of the United States. I declare such a treaty to be an act of wrong toward the native and part native people of Hawaii, an invasion of the rights of the ruling chiefs, in violation of international rights, both toward my people and toward friendly nations with whom they have made treaties. The perpetuation of the fraud whereby the constitutional government was overthrown, and finally, an act of gross injustice to me. Moreover, a petition containing 21,169 signatures of Hawaiian subjects protesting annexation was filed and presented on the floor of the Senate. In support of the Queen, protests were also filed in the Department of State in Washington, D.C. by members of the Hui Aloha Aina, Hawaiian Patriotic League, and the Hui Kalai Aina, Hawaiian Political Association. As a consequence, the United States Senate was unable to garner enough votes to ratify the so-called treaty. Additionally, and perhaps more importantly, the legal significance of the formal protests by the Queen and the nearly 40,000 signatures in the petitions created a fundamental bar to any future claim the United States may assert over the Hawaiian Islands by acquisitive prescription. Prescription is a legal principle which simply means that a foreign state occupies a portion of territory claimed by another state and encounters no protest by the owners. On April 25, 1898, 
the United States Congress declared war on Spain. While America entered into hostilities with Spain, Hawaii still found itself powerless to challenge the American-supported Republic of Hawaii, whose propaganda spread like a rabid cancer in the tiny kingdom. As such, the Queen was unable to voice any substantial protests against the United States regarding the use of Hawaiian seaports for the purpose of refueling belligerent ships of war. Due to U.S. intervention in 1893 and the subsequent creation of a puppet government, the United States took complete advantage of its own creation in the islands during the Spanish-American War. Noted Professor Christina Marek states that, Puppet governments are organs of the occupant, and as such, form part of his legal order. The agreements concluded by them with the occupant are not genuine international agreements, however correct in form, failing a genuine contracting party. Such agreements are merely decrees of the occupant disguised as the agreements, which the occupant in fact concludes with himself. Following the defeat of the Spanish Pacific Squadron in the Philippines, U.S. Congressman Francis Newlands, a Democrat from Nevada, submitted a joint resolution for the annexation of the Hawaiian Islands to the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. On May 10, 1898, hearings were held on the Newlands Resolution. U.S. Army General John Schofield testified to the committee the justification of seizing Hawaii. On May 17, 1898, Illinois Congressman Robert Hitt reported the Newlands Resolution out of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. The battle over Hawaii ensued, and for the next 29 days, the U.S. House of Representatives would witness some of the most preposterous arguments ever debated on its hallowed floor. Despite the opposition's arguments, the House of Representatives passed the resolution on the 15th of June. The resolution was now headed to the Senate for consideration. However, before the resolution reached the Senate on June 16th, Senator David Turpey, a Democrat from Indiana, made a motion to have the Senate enter into secret session. The galleries were cleared and the doors were closed to the public. On July 6, 1898, the United States Senate passed the joint resolution purporting to annex Hawaii's territories. President McKinley signed the resolution the following day, which implied that the ceding of the Hawaiian Islands had been accepted and ratified and now awaits exchange to consummate the agreement. The annexation ceremony was rehearsed so as to appear to have the semblance of two commissioned diplomats exchanging an international agreement. Mr. Sewell, American diplomat, representing the United States of America, and Mr. Dole, President of the Republic of Hawaii, also representing the United States of America. And there it is, a treaty ceremony without a treaty. Without a treaty of cession or conquest, there can be no legal exchange of Hawaiian territory. The joint resolution which suggests the annexation of Hawaii is an example of the U.S. Congress attempt to assert its authority beyond its legal capacity. President William McKinley advocated annexation of Hawaii in 1898. He said that, we need Hawaii as much and a good deal more than we did California. It is manifest destiny. On the other hand, former President Grover Cleveland, who blocked the annexation of Hawaii during his administration, wrote that McKinley's annexation of Hawaii was a perversion of our national destiny.
What you've seen this far has been a chronological genealogy of the Hawaiian Kingdom's history from a predominantly legal perspective. Periodically, commentary was added, but only so far as to accentuate points of law or to illuminate historical events, which either advanced the law or flouted it. So far, the cataloging and presentation of facts has been straightforward. Up until this point, Hawaiian law was our foundation. However, the history of 20th century Hawaii can be a slippery slope. The nature of occupation incorporates multiple jurisdictions and generally requires an unusual attention to detail. The research becomes exceedingly muddled when occupation has been disguised as something else. Add to that the necessary aspects of international law and, well, you get the idea. So here is where a hefty amount of discipline is required. If you have any questions, mark it down and investigate. There will be things that need clarifying. Four centuries of history is an ambitious enterprise. Ask your instructor for assistance. Utilize the accompanying book and its references. Simply agreeing with our findings without confirming them would be a disservice to history and to research in general. The book provides ample evidence and the means to resource them for your verification. It is of the utmost importance that, after completing this assignment, you own your conclusions. Question everything, trust nothing. It has been 118 years since that January day in 1893, when the hushed business of the capital city was shattered by the sounds of American imperialism marching through her streets. Unwarranted, uninvited, and unwanted, American Marines marched to Iolani Palace and targeted the Hawaiian throne. Gunboat diplomacy is the name for this particular brand of negotiation. Never mind treaties and agreements, we have guns. To compensate for such belligerency, International agreements are accorded tremendous strength where the law is concerned. That is to say, treaties. And all international agreements made between governments, once consummated, are apex contracts or contracts of the highest form. The now famous Blount investigation into the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom provided President Cleveland with irrefutable evidence of wrongdoing on the part of the United States. Queen Liliuokalani and President Cleveland, through the offices of their appointed agents, formalized an agreement to restore the kingdom back to the Queen's government. An agreement between two heads of state is, by definition, an international agreement and carries with it the force and effect of a treaty. This settlement, known as the Liliuokalani Assignment, is essentially all the evidence the Hawaiian Kingdom requires to prosecute its claims under international law. With the exception of time spent in Hawaii by Special Commissioner James Blount, the Hawaiian Kingdom spent the better part of six years under an American-supported puppet regime. Whether known as the Provisional Government or the Republic of Hawaii, this collection of foreign insurgents and Hawaiian subjects worked together with agents of the United States government to steal a nation. The actions of the Hawaiians involved will never have the opportunity to be tried in a court of law. Notwithstanding, it is the actions of the United States and its involvement with the overthrow of a friendly nation that begs inquiry. The Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States abided as most favored nation treaty partners. One can only speculate why the United States would either suggest or participate in acting out the motions of exchanging a treaty without an actual treaty. Children have a name for this. It's called make-believe. When the U.S. unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Kingdom by a congressional joint resolution during the Spanish-American War, it violated not only the international laws of war, but also the 1893 Liliuokalani assignment 
and agreement of restoration. In 1900, the U.S. Congress passes an act to establish a civil government to be called the Territory of Hawaii. To further exacerbate the situation, adding insult to injury, President McKinley appoints one of the principal saboteurs, Sanford B. Dole, as governor to what was now being promoted as the Territory of Hawaii. Consider for a moment the mindset of nearly every person of Hawaiian nationality in 1900. Their rights abducted, their property confiscated by the very individuals who once swore to defend the kingdom against all enemies. Their queen, innocent of any crime, tried and imprisoned by foreigners and traitors. Their flag removed from all public places and supplanted with the flag of another their language, culture, and traditions destined for eradication struggled to exist under a largely cultureless foreign government. These are just the obvious realities to consider as the beleaguered kingdom limped into the 20th century. That the islands acquired by the United States of America under an act of Congress entitled Joint Resolution to Provide for Annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States approved July 7, 1898, shall be known as the Territory of Hawaii. One sentence, written by a lawyer in a faraway land. One goal, to seize those islands. The priority, complicate any notion of wrongdoing. About 2,000 miles southwest of California's Golden Gate is the Terry of Hawaii. By choice and in fact, an integral part of our union. The first great ruler, Kamehameha, who welded the islands into one kingdom. The American flag now flies above Hawaii, for in 1898 its people sought and obtained annexation to the United States. With the transfer of sovereignty being treated as a matter of fact, the United States opened the floodgates to migration. Reaction to American imperialist cries of manifest destiny hit Hawaii shores like a tsunami. Tens of thousands of Americans flocked to the Hawaiian Islands. With Hawaii now under reputed U.S. laws, the population of U.S. citizens grew exponentially. From a meager 1900 and the census done in 1890 to a staggering 424,000 by 1950, tipping the population scale decidedly in America's favor. However, an advantage in population alone would not attend to the fact that the United States was literally attempting to violate every norm of international law in regards to Hawaii. Not a single shred of evidence exists which sufficiently explains, either legally or logically, how the United States laws have any effect on Hawaiian soil. None whatsoever. To put a fine point on it, a treaty or some mechanism of equal effectiveness provides a necessary bridge for one nation's laws to have legal effect within the borders of another nation. Without a treaty instrument, it is preposterous to think that the laws of one country possess legal authority in another. It is the President and he alone who represents the United States in foreign matters. Neither Congress nor the courts possess the power to directly affect agreements with foreign states. Seven long years of struggling to rescue the nation from the clutches of an expanding America had taken its toll on the citizenry. To assert that the average Hawaiian in 1900 was somewhat overwhelmed would be stating it lightly. But what of their children, or their children's children? Would they see recourse if the truth was known to them? What of their conceits?
Until recently, books on Hawaiian history have traditionally maintained an American point of view. With the exception of few authors, many historians chose 1900, the Organic Act, 1941, Pearl Harbor, or 1959, Statehood, as a leaping point for their work. As recent as a decade ago, anyone attempting to piece together a comprehensive understanding of Hawaii's history using contemporary books would end up with a half-ugly jigsaw puzzle. The inability to locate substantial segments of critical data dissuaded uncounted scholastic endeavors. Standardized books regarding Hawaii's history before 1900 was virtually non-existent in Hawaii classrooms. And those that made it past the territory's litmus test were shoddy at best. Children in Hawaii were taught that Hawaiians relished the idea of becoming an American. Photographs with gross captions assisted greatly in the indoctrination process. Some authors took liberties and went so far as to paint the native Hawaiian with broad, unflattering strokes. These public commentaries, which aspired to bankrupt what little self-esteem remained, was a favorite red herring of editors and writers. With few exceptions, 20th century publications routinely portrayed the native Hawaiian as passive or inept. This stereotyping became so institutionalized that it wasn't odd to hear natives themselves reciting the slander, usually tongue-in-cheek generally intending to inspire in each other loftier aspirations. I went to Kamehameha School, graduated in 1963, never heard about an overthrow. Never. Never. We were on the streets. We were on the streets doing kaholavi when we heard about the overthrow. What did you think the palace was? I have no idea. So, from what I understood on the streets, a lady named Louisa Rice found a book in the back of a taxi cab written by Queen Liliuokalani, the story of Queen Liliuokalani. And she's the one who brought this thing out in the open, out in the open on the streets. And the, and the rumors went out. There was an overthrow and it was da 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 da. So it was like, what? So the first thing is anger. Who did this? What? What? So you take that anger and use all that energy and you go find out more and more and more and more. In 1946, 53 years after the first of many violations, the United States further misrepresents its relationship with Hawaii. Article 73E of the United Nations Charter required the U.S. to provide a list of all non-self-governing territories in its possession. Hawaii, along with Alaska, American Samoa, Guam, Panama Canal Zone, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands are placed on the list transmitted to the U.N. The operative term here is non-self-governing territories, which presupposes sovereignty to be an aspiration and not a legal reality. Hawaii had already achieved recognitions of its self-governance and established its sovereignty in 1843 by way of a treaty between the Hawaiian Kingdom, France, England, and yes, the United States. After half a century of its Wizard of Oz-like methods, the U.S. seized on the opportunity in its report to the United Nations by falsifying the Hawaiian Kingdom's true legal status, literally attempting to condemn the once peaceful kingdom to the lowly status of a colonial possession. It is important to understand the role this action would play as the 20th century progressed. Hawaii's status in the United Nations as an Article 73E territory suggests that the path back to independence is through decolonization. Yet, the facts are famously known that Hawaiian sovereignty was established in 1843 by recognition of England, France, and the United States which invalidates decolonization and mandates deoccupation. Here is where the slope starts to get slippery. Hawaii's legal status was manipulated to possess conflicting characteristics, producing a false reality that would avoid examination for nearly 50 years and causing extreme confusion within the Hawaiian community. 
But all of this makes perfect sense, does it not? After all, according to Joss Whedon, half of writing history is hiding the truth. The first statehood bill was introduced in the U.S. Congress in 1919, but failed on the grounds that Congress did not view the Hawaiian Islands as an incorporated territory. Statehood advocates naturally assumed that Hawaii was part of the United States since 1898. Only after the transcripts of the Senate Secret Session of 1898 regarding Hawaii were made public, do we learn that the Senate's view of Hawaii was one of an occupied state and not an incorporated territory. Forty years would elapse before advocates pursued another attempt at statehood, confident that this time the odds would favor a positive result. After all, this is a completely new Senate. Not a single member of the old guard remained. This new Senate had lived through the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and the Korean War was fresh in their memories. On March 15, 1959, the Hawaii Statehood Bill was signed into law. On June 27, 1959, qualified voters in Hawaii, predominantly American citizens, as well as military personnel stationed in the islands, voted in favor of statehood by a margin of 132,938 to 7,854. On August 21, 1959, President Eisenhower proclaimed that the process of admitting Hawaii as a state of the Federal Union was complete. Since 1900, the U.S. migration to Hawaii, predominantly military personnel, has increased dramatically with each passing decade. Hawaii has hoped to be included in the Union ever since it was annexed to the United States in 1898. Oh, at the urging of President Eisenhower, Congress has made statehood for Hawaii a must on its legislative calendar for this year. Many Americans know Hawaii chiefly as a garden spot vacation land in the Pacific. But this region, consisting of eight principal islands, has other qualities which make it important to America. Its strategic location, 2,000 miles west of the continental U.S., makes it a vital defense outpost. It is a territory of considerable wealth, as a consequence of its strategic location, the Hawaiian Islands have played a role in every major U.S. armed conflict since the occupation began. In 1947, Hawaii became the headquarters for the single largest combined U.S. military presence in the world, the U.S. Pacific Command. U.S. Army regulations on the law of occupation not only recognize the sovereignty of the occupied state, but also prohibit the annexation of the territory. Despite the United States' violation of Hawaii's sovereignty for over a century, international laws mandate that an occupying government administer the laws of the occupied state during the occupation. Several recent cases of occupation can be easily acquired for more detailed research. The Soviet occupation of the Baltic states the American occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq, the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait, and the Japanese occupation of Manchuria. That the case of Hawaii's sovereignty will one day soon find its way to a court of inquiry is acknowledged as simply unavoidable. The evidence is too overwhelming to ignore. In 1991, the United Church of Christ passed a resolution recognizing the rights of Native Hawaiians to self-governance and self-determination. This apology was heralded as the catalyst that would start the reconciliatory process between Native and non-Native Hawaiians for the 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The resolution prompted the president of the UCC to issue a formal apology in 1993 and committed the church to redress any wrongdoings for some of its members' complicity regarding the overthrow. Part of the UCC's efforts included multi-million dollar reparations and the transference of six parcels of land on five islands to Native Hawaiian churches, the Association of Hawaiian Evangelical Churches, and the Pu'a Foundation. The formal apology from the United Church of Christ prompted the U.S. Congress to act. In 1993, the United States Congress passed a joint resolution apologizing only to Native Hawaiians 
for the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom, maintaining their centuries-long decision to downplay any notion that the citizenry of the Hawaiian Kingdom included many races who were all Hawaiian by nationality. Carefully chosen words like those found in the joint resolution have become the norm in documents pertaining to Hawaii. What makes matters worse is they rarely have any legal value. That isn't to say it's ineffective. On the contrary, the language in the joint resolution possesses a destructive quality. By apologizing to only the native Hawaiian subjects, the resolution maintains and nurtures the division between native Hawaiians and the non-native population. In 1964, John Dominus Holt published an essay entitled On Being Hawaiian. It was regarded by many in the Hawaiian community as a revelation, a glimpse into the soul of a man whose sentiments resonated with uncanny familiarity. Hawaiians don't care. This had been a familiar theme in my growing up and it was understandable to me in later years why this had become the theme song of so many Hawaiians. Disillusionment or rank disinterest are welcomed abstractions where psychic pain is so great it is difficult or impossible to search for and to find comforting antidotes to the reality of loss and defeat. The broken spirit battens on shattered dreams. Illusion and despair combine to make bitterness attractive, or in reverse, the ceaseless search for pleasure, if not euphoria, becomes a passionately sought after way of life. Most Hawaiians in the years of my growing up took one of these two paths as a way of life. In between these extremes, stood the few who adapted and abided. But among them were those who blinded themselves somehow to the widespread evidence of the ancient culture of our Hawaiian ancestors having been wantonly destroyed, and that among the few surviving people of Hawaiian ancestry, many floundered at the edges of life, bewildered, poor, and cynical. The pleasure seekers were, of course, up high on their particular heights. The weary and sad down low, groveling in misery, confusion, and rancor. And in between were the fence sitters, the imitation haole of the lower or upper classes. Very little creative work was done by part Hawaiians like myself of chiefly background occupying a privileged place in the new and artificial culture, we could not escape the facts. So we laughed and cavorted or smoldered in bitterness. We were almost gleefully indifferent to the fact that so many of our people were poor, that too many of our young were in jail, our lands, except for those held by ironclad trust estates and run by haoles, were gone. Strangers were everywhere living off the fat of the land. Hawaiians? The majority of us were poor. Most of us could not make it in this culture and seemed not to care about making it. To many of us, Haole culture was a farce, a mess, its values questionable, its goals silly and not worth fighting for. Times change people change. There has been a vast awakening among us Hawaiians of the importance of knowing in some depth about our heritage, our roots. Young people now say we must know about our history. We must find our roots. We want to learn about this in our way. Our young people look now with fervor to the possibility of becoming once again Hawaiians in spirit. They march, they carry placards, they read. More importantly, they have learned to speak out, to externalize rage and frustration. They have begun to sense, as only a Hawaiian can sense this particular thing, that a greatness, 
something intangible yet powerful and enduring belonged to our people. They know that some of this lives on in us. We are links to the ancients, connected by inheritance to their manna, their wisdom, their superb appreciation of what it is to be human. This is the foundation of the Aloha spirit. Yes, I am prouder than ever to be all Hawaiian. All around is evidence that there is reason to be proud, that there is work to do, and we are willing to take on the job. On Being Hawaiian created a silent energy, which provided the spark that ignited a generation to action, giving seed to the Hawaiian Renaissance. Although the Hawaiian Renaissance movement originally had no clear political objectives, it did reveal a genuine sense of inquiry and a thirst for a more logical history that was otherwise absent in contemporary books. Went to Kamehameha schools. My parents were really glad because they felt if I was gonna succeed and I had to learn the white man's ways. So the purpose of me going to Kamehameha was so that I could be a successful Haole. And everybody knew that, and everybody accepted that, that yeah, you have to learn how to talk good English, and you have to know the way of the white man in order to succeed. That was how you're gonna be successful in the future. When I was 14 years old, I started hunting and I got hooked into hunting. I mean, it was like, I'm, I was gonna be a hunter. So that got me into a lot of trouble because the deer didn't understand no trespassing. The deer didn't understand keep out. And I had to follow the deer, otherwise I wouldn't be able to feed my family. So landowners hated me. Molokai Ranch hated me. Because I couldn't get a job, I had to hunt every day. It made me think a little bit different. You had to be more of an independent thinker. I didn't rely on anybody um, so that I could raise my family. I had to rely totally on myself. And it was the kupuna who gave me direction. Um, Kamehameha School gave me the ability to read and write. And the kupuna gave me the reason to read and write. But we started learning how to organize through Queen Little Colony Children's Center. That combination and my ability to go in whatever direction um, allowed me to follow the visions of the kupuna. But times have changed. They locked the gates. There was no access to the resources that allowed them to survive. So for me, my two major focuses was access and having those resources there and available for me to survive. So here we are on Molokai. We need access, we need our resources. The ranch comes into Molokai and they lock all the gates. They stop all the access for the people on two thirds of the island where all the fish are, all the deer are. So in order for us to get what we need, we had to organize. So we formed a group called Hui Alaloa. It was based on the ability of Hawaiians to walk around every island that was guaranteed by Kamehameha I in his first law that was punishable by death. So that was Mamaloho Kanabai. So we used that law as our foundation to keep us alive and surviving. So it was Kamehameha's, you know, gift to us. We got a phone call from Maui saying, Hey, we're going to do something on Kaha Olave. You guys want to help out? I said, shoot, what's going on? I said, oh, we need somebody to do the hunting. Okay, because we got to eat when we're on Kaha Olave. I didn't understand Kaha Olave at all, the politics of Kaha Olave. So Charlie Maxwell was the one who organized us, and we went over. And the way things turned out, we became the leaders of Kaha Olave for whatever reasons. And that island was, was the, like the turning point of my whole life. Kaholawe became the island that spoke to me and said, I am dying 
I am dying. And I said, okay, I have to go and save this island. Ship and ground forces of the United States Navy, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and by Allied Naval Forces. Training facilities afforded at Kaho Lobby for all services cannot be duplicated at any of the existing training areas in the Hawaii area. The most significant value of Kaho Lobby is that it is the only facility in the Hawaiian area permitting the training necessary for military forces to effectively coordinate the employment of all available supporting arms. To the point where we took on the United States of America. Who in your right mind would take on not just the United States, but the United States military, right? And the irony of the whole battle was we became the activists, we became the aggressors, we were the bad guys, we were the guys that was Pilau. And the military who has all the guns, the battleships, the bombs, everything, they were the good guys. And we were militants. We had nothing. All we had was tea leaves on our heads, tea leaves on our tea leaves to protect us from all the bombs. That's all we had. And then the kupuna gave us the ultimate weapon, right? The kupuna told us there is no more powerful thing than aloha. That we can kill him with aloha. <laughs> what, Auntie? <laughs> yes. Ooh, you know. And that was, that's aloha aina. So the love of the land was going to conquer the United States military. And it did. of Koho'olawe. From the beginning, your name was Kanaloa, the god. You are the southern beacon, barren and without population, until the young appeared and they brought you peace. Let us band together. People of Hawaii, from sun up to sun down, stand together and follow. Be strong people. We are but a few. Great is our love for our land. Popular are the young people of Hawaii for the civil strike against the government. Together in one thought for the righteousness of our land. Forward, young people. Victory for Kamo'olabe. Popular are the young people of Hawaii name for the civil strife against the government. Together in one thought for the righteousness of the land. Forward, young people. Victory for Koho'o Labe. Oh, there's no regrets because they stopped the bombing. So it's like, yeah, I would do it all over again. <laughs> As a result, Native Hawaiians began to draw meaning from a history that appeared to parallel other peoples of similar circumstance. 
the Hawaiian Renaissance gradually branched out to form a political wing, often referred to as the Sovereignty Movement. This evolved into a political resistance of U.S. sovereignty over the Hawaiian Islands. As groups began to organize, the political movement mimicked the activism surrounding the women's liberation and the American civil rights movements. In 1972, ALOHA, Aboriginal Lands of Hawaiian Ancestry, was formed to seek reparations from the United States for its involvement with the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Ohana o Hawaii, which formed in 1974, went so far as proclaiming a declaration of war against the United States. In 1975, Aloha joined with Hui Ala Loa and formed PKO, or Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana. PKO's mission statement was simple and clear. Stop the U.S. Navy from using Kaho'olawe as target practice. The Hawaiian sovereignty movement is now clearly the most potent catalyst for change. During the 1980s and early 1990s, the sovereignty movement was transformed from an outlandish idea propagated by marginal groups into a legitimate political position supported by a majority of Native Hawaiians. Armed with PhDs and an unmistakable desire to remove the colonizers from the equation, Kalahui stepped onto the scene in 1987 and instantly caught the attention of the Hawaiian community. Kalahui's honest, albeit fiery brand of in-your-face speech sent a shockwave through the islands that invigorated the old guard and inspired the next generation. Whether you agree with their politics or not, the sovereignty movement's methods of communicating its initiative all but abolished complacency. Hui Na'awao, Kapakaukau, Nation of Hawaii, the Hawaiian Patriotic League, and countless kingdoms and nations continue to dot the sovereignty landscape as they toil towards an independent Hawaii. The wheels are in motion, the facts are unimpeachable, and the proof overwhelming. All that remains is courage and cohesion.